Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are you doing? I think you're going to love this episode. It's with Alexis Devine. If you're on social media, if you've been following Maisie's process with using sound buttons, her dog, Bunny, what about Bunny, is on social media. And I realized as we were talking that a lot of the modeling that I've done with Maisie has been because of what I've watched Alexis do with her dogs. If you're interested in that concept of animal communication and the things that animals have to communicate, even if you're not a pet owner, Alexis talks about some of the buttons that she has for Bunny include happy, mad, concerned, sad, ugh, as in frustration, and good. (laughs) I'm really, I'm frustrated because I'm imagining if you're listening and you're going, ugh, this doesn't do anything for me, which is totally fine. You don't have to be as fascinated as I am. But the thought of communicating with animals is just amazing. Alexis talks about how she got interested in this, what her background is. She's got some great resources for you in this episode. I don't know. I think it's great. We also talk about where Maisie's at, some of the stumbling blocks that we've had, how you figure out what words to use. She has just introduced the button, sorry, to her animals. I think she's got thank you. She just also introduced hot and cold. I don't know. I I didn't take very many notes because it's just so fascinating. And she talks about the research that UCSD is doing in cognitive science and a community that you can join if you're interested in using the sound buttons. The research study that Maisie and I are enrolled in has 7,000 enrolled participants all over the world. She thinks that This is just really a very ethical project to be involved in. I I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what else I can say to convey how enthusiastic I am about this. There will be a part two that we recorded that will be coming out for episode 160. If you enjoyed this, I'm not going to bother talking about what 160 is about, but we talk about some entirely different things because there was so much to cover. So let me tell you a little bit about Alexis. Alexis Devine is an artist and entrepreneur hailing from Seattle, Washington. She is a licensed family dog mediator and a certified canine enrichment technician. Her sheepadoodle bunny, known as What About Bunny on social media, became an internet sensation in the fall of 2020 when videos of her communicating with assistive technology from Fluent Pet went viral. Bunny now has over 100 buttons individually programmed with various words that she uses to communicate how she feels, what she wants, to express when she is in pain, and even to chat about her dreams. She is part of an ongoing canine cognition research study at the Comparative Cognition Lab at UCSD. They have recently added a standard poodle to the family named Otter, who Alexis is training with the same system. Alexis's goal is to further our understanding of the power of connection and importance of two-way communication. Meeting her dogs where they are at and understanding them on their terms first to facilitate trust and promote an environment that supports them as the incredible creatures they are. I'm just really excited about this, y'all. My hope is that you're as excited as I am because I would love to have Alexis back over and over and over because there's so much to talk about and it's just It's fascinating to me. I mean, think about our sensitivities and what we perceive and being able to communicate with your animal about it. These buttons are used with dogs, with cats, horses. I've seen them used with, I think, guinea pigs. They've been used with pigs. I mean, just the possibilities are endless. And we don't talk about it in any of these episodes, but Bunny talks about her dreams. I mean, can you imagine? Anyways, I'm just very excited and I'm nerding out on this. And now... On to the show. Hey, Alexis, welcome. Thanks, Patricia. I'm so glad to be here. I'm really excited about our conversation today. I'm so excited to talk to you. I followed you and Bunny before I even thought about using a soundboard for my dog. So the fact that we're here talking is like, 
I'm just so excited. <laughs> it's probably how other people feel about me that they feel like they know me and like I'm just having that like, oh, I, I know you. I know Bunny. I know Otter. <laughs> well, in a way you do. I mean, I feel like people online have seen so much of their life that they really do feel invested and feel like they're a part of the journey with us, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I love having that yeah. support and that connection and community. Yeah, you have a pretty large community. I'm curious, what got you interested in using the soundboard with Bunny? Because I don't really know what your origin story is. So my origin story, I have wanted a dog for a very, very long time. And it had never been the right time for me. Either I didn't have a stable job or I was working too much or didn't have a, a home with a yard. Or Finally, I was in the right place, right time, stable job, working from home married, great house. And I started doing research. And then I asked my husband, Hey, what do you think about getting a dog? And it was like a no, it was, it was a solid no for like two years. And then finally I asked him, he's like, okay, maybe a small dog. And that was like, yes. Right. I mean, that, that means yes for me. And so we didn't get a small dog, but I started doing even more research and started reading as much as I could about dog training and how to care for a dog and what to feed a dog and what kind of dog to get. And then I uh, came across Christina Hunger's page and was absolutely floored by the work that she was doing with Stella as hundreds of thousands of other people were. I was like, well, this is amazing. And one of the reasons I'd wanted a dog is because there's just something so special about the type of connection you can have with a non-human animal that has been sort of evolutionarily selected for its ability to cooperate and communicate with us. Right. So I was like, mm -hmm. I, I want to have, I want to have a dog. I want to have the best relationship I possibly can, the closest connection, the best communication. And then as I came across Christina Hunger, I was like, oh, well, this is a wonderful tool to pack in my belt and use on this journey of connection and communication. Sort of, you know, no expectation of success whatsoever. I figured this was something that only a speech language pathologist or a scientist could probably achieve. For those people who don't know who Christina Hunger is in her work. I, I did talk about it in the previous episode, but can you just give a brief synopsis if somebody, this is first time like, well, who's Christina Hunger? Yeah, she is a new speech language pathologist down in San Diego. She had like just begun her career. She was working with nonverbal autistic children and she got a puppy right around the same time. And she thought to herself, well, if I can do this with nonverbal autistic children, why wouldn't I be able to do this with my puppy Stella. And so she tried and it worked to the surprise of the world. So that's who she is. And she's since published a book. I forget what it's called, but it's great. How Stella Learned to Talk. It's exactly. an amazing book. So if you're interested, and I'll put it in the show notes, How Stella Learned to Talk by Christina Hunger, H-U-N-G-E-R. Please go ahead with your story though. Okay. So where was I? Oh yeah. So I, I thought it was not necessarily something that I would be able to achieve, but I am creative. I'm extraordinarily curious and I am very tenacious. So before Bunny came home, I had an outside button waiting by the door. I read everything I could about how to incorporate that process within our daily routine. And then when she came home, in addition to teaching her basic obedience and potty training and just sort of building our bond, I would press the outside button every time we went outside and I would say outside and when we went outside, we'd have a little outside party, just reinforcing that as heavily as possible. And it took just a few weeks for her to press it herself. And I was floored. It was one of those sort of like screaming moments where Johnny and I were watching Netflix or something, eating dinner. Bunny was over by the door, sitting by the button. She was looking down at the button, then up at us, and then down at the button, then up at us. We were sort of watching out of the corner of our eye. Then she lifted up her paw, looked at us, and smashed the outside button. And her ears sort of like flew outward as she looked back up at us like, oh, my God, I did it. And I screamed. I was like, oh, my God, outside. And then we went outside. We had an outside party. And that was it. I was like, she can learn one button. She can learn two. She can learn two. She can learn 10. Game on. And we've been growing our board ever since. She's, she's at about 100, 101 words right now. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Maisie's first word was play and I have it. We got cameras, so I have it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she just pressed play. She pressed play. Oh my gosh. And I had actually watched your video on how to do the target training with the paw. Oh, good. Pri well, not so good. Oh. <laughs> 
But prior to knowing that I was going to do the soundboard, when I was training her, one of the tricks that they had taught us was if you put your hand up and they touch your hand with their nose. And because I don't know a lot of tricks, I reinforced that a lot because I had nothing else to reinforce. And so I watched the video of you training Bunny and I tried to do it with Maisie and I just couldn't. And I thought, Ugh. so when I put the buttons down, I thought, please just let this work. And fortunately it did because I was not, a, like, I really wanted to see, well, what does target training look like? So you're trying to teach the dog to target, to touch something with their paw. And I tried and I just couldn't get it to do. And I'm having this little sensor thing, like, you're probably not the person to be telling this to, but since I'm already halfway there, it's, it's too late. <laughs> I think it would have been more helpful to watch somebody that was having a dog that was not getting it because Bunny already knew what to do. And so you're showing and like, my dog isn't doing that. And like, yeah. I don't know what to do. And it's often really easy for me to go like, oh, forget it. You know, like, I don't know what to do. But anyways, we digress. So yes, it's very exciting. That first word when you start seeing them make connections. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting. So back to your story now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very powerful moment. And it just gives you sort of all the motivation you need to keep moving forward. Because at the beginning, at least for me, and I think I've, I've heard this in other people's stories too, you just have no idea what's going to happen, if they're going to get it, if they're going to enjoy it, if it works, if it's if it takes mm -hmm. a special type of dog or a special type of person or a special relationship, you just have no idea. And so that first success is just like really, really motivating. And I feel like for a lot of people, that first button, it's sort of, if you're here, I have my hands about a foot apart. If you're here with your relationship before the first button press and the first button press, your hands like get half as much closer, right? It's just like, mm -hmm. oh, instantaneously, you're like, well, something's happening. We've got a back and forth going on. There's communication happening and this is worthwhile. And mm -hmm. I think that's an important moment, but I, I think it's also really important in the process to acknowledge that our animals are communicating all the time. And mm -hmm. one of the ways to have the most success with this process is to be listening to them always before buttons, right? You really need to know your learner in order to be able to provide words that are of value to them. So mm -hmm. I think it takes a person who's already dedicated to the process of understanding their dog to have success with the buttons. So it's not just you get the buttons, you teach your dog how to use them, and then all of a sudden you've got great communication. I think it takes a fair amount of dedication. It takes a, a lot of trust, a strong bond and decent communication to begin with. Yeah. Initially, I looked at what other people were doing because I wanted to map out the words that I wanted to use and where I wanted to put them because I know that once you put down buttons in a certain place, you don't want to move them around. So I really wanted to map it out ahead of time and was a little bit methodical. And then I hit this place where I intuitively had a sense of what button she needed next and then we're at a little bit of a stall that we can talk about a little bit later. I would love to have you talk about, well, how long has Bunny been using her soundboard? Uh, well, she just turned three. And as I mentioned, she had a, an outside button waiting for her before she came home at eight weeks. So just about three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she knows about 101 words. Do you have 101 buttons? Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't counted them recently. Right. And you mentioned not removing or moving around buttons, but that's something that I've done several times and it hasn't seemed really? to affect the process too much. Yeah. Especially in the beginning, before I started working with Fluent Pet, our buttons were arranged in a grid on a piece of plywood, like Christina mm -hmm. Hunger, and they weren't sure organized in any sort of way, just a, mm -hmm. a grid. And as soon as I started working with Fluent Pet, you know, I moved all of the buttons into hex tiles and I organized them based on the Fitzgerald key. What's the Fitzgerald key? A method developed by Edith Fitzgerald in the early 1900s to help deaf children learn grammar and syntax. So essentially words are organized in categories and moving from left to right in the way that you would build a sentence. So you've got a tile that's full of places and a tile that's full of people and a tile that's full of verbs. And in this way, instead of having to know, okay, the walk button is in this position in this huge mass of buttons, she can say, okay, the things that I want to do are in this area. And there's seven of them that I have to choose from. And the walk is in, in the center of that or whatever. So she has a, an easier time compartmentalizing the words and understanding where to find them. So she has to think, think less, it's less exhausting to use her board in that sense. I'm relieved because I set mine up that way. Good. 
<laughs> started to talk and I panicked. Oh, no. Oh. Um, anyways. <laughs> no, it's perfect. When was the last time that you added buttons? Are you continuing to add buttons? Yeah, I hadn't for quite some time. And then just recently I added hot and cold because we're in a hot okay. spell here. And because I've thought about adding those forever because mm-hmm. Bunny gets chilly and I have to wrap her in a blanket in the winter time. And then she gets, she just like melts in the summertime. Like today it's going to be 93 degrees or something. So I want to be able to tell her that it's super, super hot and that it's going to be okay. It's going to be all done tomorrow. You know, sort of explain that feeling to her. What else did I add? I added, I added another interesting word just recently and I can't for the life of me remember. Oh, sorry. I added sorry, which I have, I've been modeling it. So she has a tendency to micromanage otter loudly and vocally. And who's Otter? Oh, yes, of course. Otter is our one-year-old standard poodle. We added him to our family last year. And he is a funny, funny guy. And he's got a ton of energy. And they love each other, but they also hate each other. At least on from Bunny's end, it's love-hate. From his end, it's just like, whatever, play with me or don't. I don't care. I've got other things to do, like hump pillows. Well, she likes to be in control of the situation, and she'll correct him if he's moving when he's not supposed to, right? So I added a sorry button and I've been modeling it after she does that. And it's not inappropriate behavior. And pressing the sorry button after that wouldn't necessarily mean that she's sorry, but I am curious to see how she uses it and how she interprets my use of it. Sure. So yeah, those are a few that we just added last week. Oh, that's great. Can you talk about some of the feeling words. I mean, she she can be incredibly existential with some of the things that she's said. So can we talk about what that looks like conceptually? And then I'd love to talk about just some recent examples that I've seen because it's just so fascinating to me when the video that I'm thinking is, is a recent one that came up in my feed about when Otter presses a button over and over and that makes Bunny big mad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then Otter had feelings about it and Bunny had feelings about it. It was just fascinating to me. But so can we start with some of the, con- you know, the feeling words and some of the existential concepts that she talks about? So I think those are two separate conversations. Okay. The feeling words, I added happy and mad uh, pretty early on. I mean, a lot of people ask, how could I possibly model those? And it just didn't seem far-fetched to imagine that I could capture those emotions in myself or in her to model them. Because I think anyone who's lived with a dog and knows their dog, you know when they're happy, you know when they're afraid. So yeah, I find a moment wherein she is happy. She's got that open mouth smile, loose wiggly body language, low, soft, swishy tail wag, and I model happy. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And same for Mad. She really dislikes birds on our deck. And that's clear to see. So she would see a bird, high flagging tail, stiff body language, short, sharp, shrill bark. I would model Mad. Then I added concerned because, you know, I started noticing that Bunny had quite a bit of anxiety and we added sad, which I didn't see a lot of in her. And I still don't see a lot of sad in her, but I think it's an important word to have because it's, it's an emotion that's big. Mm -hmm. And then I added UGH, U-G-H, because she really seems to be rolling her eyes a lot of the time. And that was the Mm -hmm. only sort of emotional connection to that, like annoyed kind of feeling Mm -hmm. that I could make. And she uses that button quite regularly. What other emotion words do we have? I have good, which could be a generic sort of emotion or could be used for all sorts of things. And I think that's it. So yeah, for, Mm -hmm. for each of those, I just tried to find moments wherein it seemed to me like she was experiencing an approximation of how I understood that emotion Mm -hmm. and model it. And it seems to have worked quite well. Yeah. My dog is a real barker, so I haven't added any feeling words. No, we have happy down and she has a dog that she plays with two doors down. That's a real barker. And the bark is play with me, touch me. Their fence is open. So anybody that walks by, the bark is very, it sounds very angry. It's a golden retriever. It sounds like an angry bark, but it's really, hey friend, look at me, look at me, come pet me, come pet me. And when this dog barks, that's June bug, my dog barks. And so I've, I've often started to say, you hear June bug, you hear the sound, are you concerned? 
because I have a terrier mix and she's very reactive. And so I'm trying to figure out what the language is to understand what's going on with her because she is also going through adolescence. And it's interesting when she was using the buttons a lot, the barking decreased. And now that Mm. she's in adolescence, she's not initiating contact with the buttons. She will respond to us with maybe one word, but the barking has increased and it feels like it's protective barking. There's somebody out there. I want you to know there's somebody. I'm protecting you. I'm showing you that I'm here. That's what my interpretation is. Interesting. It's been very challenging. So we, we can talk about that a little bit later, but I also watch how you model with Bunny and that's been a real role model for me or if we're outside playing, I'm like, you know, Maisie Happy, play bear now. So looking at when she's really engaged and using those words. And then I love when she'll use like happy. Yeah. <laughs> she'll, she'll say that she's happy. It's like, oh, it, it's just so sweet. She said happy Patricia home. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have a sense of what the next thing to talk about? I mean, I know that you're not in my head, but I, there's all these places that I want to go. Is there a next progression that seems logical for you to talk about with your work with Bunny? You were interested in talking a little bit about the research and how I got involved in that. So we could yeah, we yeah. talk about that a little bit. Sure. So about six months into my journey with Bunny, I came into contact with Leo Trottier. He had posted something in some Facebook group saying that he was looking for beta testers of a canine specific AAC device. And I was like all over it. And why don't you explain who, who Leo is? Yeah, Leo Trottier is the founder and CEO of Clever Pet and now Fluent Pet. And Fluent Pet, of course, is the company that designs the buttons and hex tiles that we use and of the They Can Talk community and the They Can Talk research that is now happening at the Comparative Cognition Lab at UCSD. So I saw this Facebook post and I think maybe at that time we were a little bit stalled out or like, I just didn't understand like where to go with the process. And I was like, do I just Mm -hmm. like keep expanding this grid of words infinitely? Like, how do I know what word to add next? How do I, are these organized properly? Like what if I would get lost in all those buttons. So I could Mm -hmm. only imagine that so would Bunny. So yeah, I jumped on that opportunity because I really was excited to have some of my decisions going forward informed by cognitive science. So I talked to him the next day, we set up a meeting and that was that. Then I got some Fluent Pet prototypes in the mail, like a few days later, and I have been using the various iterations of the Fluent Pet system ever since. And that's been really wonderful. Like the community that has developed around Fluent Pet is amazing. I mean, it's just all of these really curious humans that want to do right by their animal companions and really want to sort of explore the depths, just like I did, of connection and communication and see what's possible, guided by the spirit of what if and why not. And I feel like the community is open-minded in a way that is very refreshing. There's very little judgment in the community. There's a lot of community support. People lift each other up. They brainstorm. The forums at how.theycantalk.org are a wonderful place for troubleshooting. If like, I can't get my dog to touch the button or what does this word combination mean? Has anyone else experienced this? This is a great place to get feedback and brainstorm and troubleshoot. And of course, now I think there are what was it like 7,000 enrolled participants in the They Can Talk study that's happening through the Comparative Cognition Lab at UCSD and many, many, many more people that are are using the buttons and not participating in the study. So yeah, that is how I got involved with Fluent Pet and I'm still very involved with Fluent Pet. I'm really, really excited about the work they're doing and the ethics of the project and the direction that they are helping people go. And I I think within the next, within the next year, there should be, I think the goal is like three peer reviewed papers. So we'll see, we'll see what happens with that, but that's a a pretty exciting goal and development. And they have researchers in the, they can talk community. There's a Facebook page. I'll put it in the show notes. I have it unless you know off the top Mm -hmm. of I think it's sound button training for pets, colon. I'll put it in the show notes. 
Okay. And the researchers are in there. There are a lot of people in there that have been using the soundboards and really great feedback and support if you're getting stuck and you don't know what to do. And that's where I went before. I actually posted about, I really want to get the buttons, but I was so afraid I wouldn't follow through. What if the dog didn't use them? What, you know, like, please, somebody just help me just jump off the Aww. ledge. And people were so supportive in there. And we're part of the research oh, okay. study too. And we've got the yeah. app for logging all of her presses and everything. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I'm really excited about the app to be public as well, because it's such a valuable tool to track how many words your user is learning per day, what words are they using more than others, what words do maybe you need to focus on modeling more because they're not using as much or, you know, I think it's a it's a really valuable tool. Yeah. And the way that the app works is all of the words that you have buttons for anytime your your user, your learner presses a button, you log it in and then you choose who pressed the button and then you can make notes about it. So Maisie's going through this stage where she's, she kind of chooses different words for what she means. And they're not always exactly, I think the other day she said she wanted to go potty and she really wanted to go outside and play with the flirt pole. And we have a button for Mm -hmm. flirt pole. And sometimes she'll Mm -hmm. say bear and sometimes she doesn't use outside. She'll use different things. And so then I'll make a note Mm -hmm. that said, you know, she said potty, but she went outside and she stared at the flirt pole, which is what she wanted so that the researchers can, have more information. I mean, I'm assuming that's helpful. I don't know. Maybe you have something to say about that. Yeah, for sure. Bunny's done that a lot too, where perhaps she's requested outside and I said, no, we just went outside or, you know, I'm working right now. And so she'll say potty because how how do you say no to that? Like, I I don't want to pee in the house. (laughs) Like, okay, we can go potty. And then she's outside like, (laughs) trick you. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to have you talk about What has changed in your relationship with Bunny and Otter having the soundboards? And do you know the video that I'm talking about where Bunny got mad that Otter was pressing buttons a couple of times? Are you able Mm -hmm. to relay the gist of that conversation just so people understand? Yeah, I can't remember exactly what happened, but Bunny pressed two buttons at once. They were outside and upstairs. And I was like, okay, which do you want? Do you want outside or do you want upstairs? And I was, you know, giving her space to respond. Otter walked over to her board and he pressed dog and then like looked up at me and smiled. And then uh, Bunny walked away momentarily. Otter came over and started like smashing buttons or something. And I was like, buddy, we can't, we can't do this. We can't do this. Bunny walked back to the board and she pressed no. Like I, I was saying no to Otter. We can't be doing this. And then I cut the film, stopped recording because I had to like manage Otter, turned it back on. And I was explaining to Otter that when he does that, it makes Bunny big mad because those are her buttons and he needs to, you know, show respect to her buttons. And Bunny was just watching and he said, sad and concerned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that that was the that was the event, right? He said sad and concerned. Yeah. And, you know, the the most interesting part about that to me is that I I haven't modeled sad and concerned Mm -hmm. for him. Like I have been very, very hands off with teaching otter he has a few buttons of his own but on his own board he rarely uses any buttons except for outside beach and upstairs Mm. but he'll use all sorts of buttons on bunny's board that i have never introduced to him so it's it's fascinating and he'll he'll use them in contextually appropriate Mm -hmm. ways too which always surprises me i'm like there's just there's just no way right but there is so that's been a really really interesting process to witness. Mm -hmm. And in terms of how having the buttons has influenced our relationships, that's that's a hard question to answer because they've both always, they've never not had the buttons, right? Mm -hmm. They've had the buttons both since, since they arrived at the house. So it's hard for me to say how our relationships would be different without them. But I can say one thing for sure, that when you get deep into the process of really working with your learner to use these buttons, by default, you end up spending a lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. You end up spending a lot of time trying to understand what they're saying and and really listening to them. So it is possible that without the buttons, I be less engaged with them, Mm -hmm. perhaps, or that I wouldn't listen as well. I don't know for sure. But I, I think it's definitely an enhancement to our relationship. And I definitely spend a whole lot of time focused on it. You know, I make myself physically available for her to use the button. So Mm -hmm. I position myself in a room to do my work that are near the buttons. I start my morning 
creating dialogue with her, seeing if there's anything that she wants to do, asking her how she's feeling, Mm. asking her if she had any dreams that she remembers. So yeah, there's just a, you know, my world kind of revolves around them in Mm -hmm. that way now. And I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. And you have to be willing to be, I mean, I think about, I have twins that are grown now, but I feel like I did a lot of armchair parenting because I was just so exhausted and, you know, stop mm-hmm. it. Don't do that with no follow through. And so, yeah, I guess how that turned out. They're beautiful human beings <laughs> now, but <laughs> it, it was a very tired form of parenting. And we have our buttons in the living room where we often will watch TV and do things. And it means being willing to get out of the recliner every time she wants to play and tell her later. Yeah. It's also surprised at how many people said, like, I don't want my dog asking for more things. Like, they already asked for enough things. And I've explained, like, you just put an all done or a later button and you get to set limits with them. And and I've seen in your videos, and I've done it too, when they're insistent. And then I just feel bad, you know, please or happy or love you. <laughs> It's like, yeah. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it just means 10 minutes. It means stopping what I'm doing and I go out for 10 minutes and that's really all she wants. And I think we have this concept of, you know, I'm not going to be able to, I've had these long days and I just sit down like, I just want to relax. And she just needs a little bit of time. And, and just that little bit of time seems to really settle her down. I don't know. Has that been your experience as well? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely an element of attention seeking. Mm Mm-hmm amongst some of the button pressing, right? Like it doesn't necessarily matter what it is. Sometimes she's just like, look at me right Mm -hmm. now, pay attention to me. And exactly like you said, if you just give them a little, a little bit of your time to say hello, ask them how they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, You don't even have to do that with words if you don't want to, but just a little bit of attention, a little bit of bonding. And sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. And for right now, because Maisie's not initiating much in the evenings, it's funny, she'll sit and she'll she can just sit and piercingly look at us. We're watching TV and she's mm-hmm. just piercingly looking at us or she'll pace and she whines and what do you want, Maze? Use your buttons. And sometimes she'll use them, but she communicates very clearly. You know, if she wants to go see Junebug, she goes to the front door. If she wants to play, she goes to the back door. Sometimes she sits in the back patio and looks through the kitchen window and just one bark, which means I want the flirt pole or we go outside and she lasers in on the flirt pole. And I have to remind myself, my goal is I want to communicate with her and it doesn't have to be through the buttons. I, I do try and say, use your words to get her to communicate, but I'm not going to force her to it's not like you have to use buttons before we're going to do anything, but the goal is to communicate. And she has all kinds of ways of communicating and it's not always with the buttons. And I don't know if this is just adolescence. And so she needs a break or if she needs more buttons, like, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I'm totally open. I know we haven't talked much about her. Yeah. I'd love to know more about her. And I think it's normal. I think humans too go through phases. Sometimes they talk more, sometimes they talk less, sometimes they're more introverted, sometimes they're more extroverted. And I think giving her the opportunity to use them and Mm -hmm. asking her if she wants to, but then honoring her requests, regardless of whether she does, is exactly the right thing to do, you know? And there's really nothing lost. Like, obviously you are quite dedicated to your relationship with her and quite dedicated to your communication with her and you're listening to her. So if she decides not to, that's great. She's still going to be heard. And if she decides to, great, you're going to honor that too. Yeah. She's the most curious dog I've ever had. We put a bed frame together and she was just in there and looking at everything. And anytime I take out, I keep the box of extra buttons that we haven't used left on a shelf. And anytime I take it out, she's just lasered in on what I'm doing and watching and fascinated. And I put them down. My son's dog was here for the weekend. They brought the dog and the cat and we've got a blind dog and the puppy. So <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> but his dog accidentally stepped on the buttons. And the dog cocked his head like, what was that? And he stepped on a couple more. And then when he hit walk, my son immediately praised him for a walk and took him out for a walk. I don't know if they're going to use button training, but it was so cute to see him, you know, seeing it. And then we've got the blind dog who accidentally walks over the button. So (laughs) that's awesome. It's not intentional. (laughs) Yeah, still, nonetheless, you can still reinforce unintentional presses and then they become intentional. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's important too. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to share? I feel like there's so much richness that I've experienced through your videos and I'm just having this thing like, I don't know that we've conveyed that enough. So is there anything that you want to share that I haven't asked you about before we wrap up? I think the most important thing that I try and remember, and we've already touched on this a bit, is just that they're communicating all the time and this isn't 
a method by which all of a sudden, oh my God, your dog's communicating. This is like extra credit or something, right? Mm -hmm. Like you should already be be listening and you should already know that they, they have these opinions and feelings. Those exist within any sentient creature. And this might be an easier way for us to interpret those emotions. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that first in order to have the most success later. Just understanding how unique and whole and complex they are and really trying to adapt your communication to reflect that in the best way you can. Yeah. And looking for their ability to communicate. That was, I, I don't think I can articulate it very clearly. And if you can, please jump in. But I know when I read Christine Hunger's book, it's like they want to communicate and assume that they can communicate and look for the communication where I think people just think like they're dogs, like you feed them, you walk them, they play, and that's all there is. But I really turned it around to look for what is she trying to tell me and looking, learning more about body language. And, you know, I think all the ways that dogs do appeasement, we think that they like it and they don't. They're just appeasing us and kind of being submissive and, you know, really doing what mm -hmm. we can to learn about, about animals. Any thoughts about that before we wrap up again? <laughs> I agree. I mean, I, there are no like requirements for starting with the buttons, but I think it would be amazing if everyone could take a, a quick little doggy body language course before mm -hmm. they did. I just think that's going to give you a really solid start, but just observing your dog without the buttons, seeing what they, what they look towards, what they're signaling towards. Do they back away when you come in for a head pat? Do they move into you? Just being cognizant of the ways they're telling you things mm -hmm. without words. Yeah, definitely. And you can start using the words before you even get the buttons. I mean, that's really what you want to do is start using language that's geared toward how you want to start using buttons. I mean, that's my thought. What's your thought? Oh, totally. I mean, I've always been one of those people that like talks out loud to everything. Yeah. Like I'm just talking out loud to myself constantly. So it felt really natural to just talk out loud to Bunny and to Otter. And I, I think maybe that feels awkward for some people, but that it is really important that they hear those words mm -hmm. to be able to start building those associations. The more you use them in the right context, the more they hear them in the right context, the more sense it's going to make quickly to them. Yeah. yeah. Alexis, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I have all of your social media. In fact, do you want to just say where people can find you and I will also read it. It will be in the show notes. Sure. Yeah. You can find me at what about bunny on a whole bunch of platforms, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and also at one of what about bunny.com. Perfect. And thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Hey again. So I'm curious to know what you thought about this episode. I don't know about you, but I just find this stuff so incredibly fascinating. I think there are so many implications to how we are as highly sensitive people, deep thinkers, deep feelers, knowing that we've got animals that have sensitivities the ability to communicate where we need assistance with people understanding us and being sensitive to our needs, how we can do that for animals. I don't know. I just find this totally amazing. I hope that you do too. Episode 160 will be coming out in two weeks. It's part two of this interview with Alexis. We do a shift in what we talk about. I'm going to let you wait and see until that comes out. If you enjoyed this, I think that you'll really love this other episode that we do, but we do take a little bit of a veer. So we talk about some new things on this other episode. If you all enjoy having Alexis on, please shoot me an email. Let me know. She's willing to come back. I would love to talk to her more, but I'm just trying to figure out what's interesting to you as my interest change. If you are wanting to work with me, if you have any questions or comments, you can reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive at gmail.com. You can also look at my website. I work with people all over the world. <laughs> and I'm more than happy to work with you. I've figured out a way of coaching HSPs. It really, I think, helps you lean into your sensitivities, your strengths, 
really learning how to thrive as a highly sensitive person. You know, as you know, there are things about being highly sensitive that are amazing and there are some challenges too. And it's a mixed bag and learning how to navigate both of those things, relationships, boundaries, attachment injuries. You know, Jen and I have been talking, you don't know this, but we took a month off from podcasting, but we've been talking in the interim and we've both been going through our stuff. So being human means we're going to have struggles and having that support, the unconditional love, having somebody who gets you where you can show up and talk about whatever's going on is incredibly, incredibly healing. And if you don't have that, my hope is that you either reach out to me or you find somebody where you can get that unconditional support and to really learn more about yourself and learn some tools and strategies to help you manage because life shouldn't be a total struggle. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're enjoying this time of the year. We're heading into fall here. We're having a heat wave at the time that I'm recording this, so it does not feel very fallish at all. (laughs) I appreciate each and every one of you. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's your superpower. Have a blessed day. 